from Super League to Olympic distance to age group world records to Kona. Go longer with the right fuel at the right time with S Fuels. Here at Breakfast about from beautiful Huggos on the Rocks. My name is Bob Babbitt. We're brought to you by Master Spas, S Fuels Go Longer, Hoka Let's Fly, Form Smart Swim Goggles, Katana Ruzut, the original triathlon brand. Of course, our Challenged Athletes Foundation, our next guest, a true legend of our sport. He's in the Ironman Hall of Fame, the USA Triathlon Hall of Fame. This week, his 33rd consecutive Ironman World Championship on the microphone, his 210th Ironman overall. Give it up, Mr. Mike Riley. Pretty fun. Really, really fun. <laughs> you, you've had a, a pretty nice week. A uh, pretty nice week and a pretty good 33-year run also. <laughs> so when we chatted and you, you called and said, hey, this is going to be my last, we're, we're winding down, my last few. And, I, you know, it made so much sense because when Andy was growing up and Aaron was growing up, you missed a lot of stuff because you worked pretty much every weekend. That pretty much was the impetus, right? With your grandkids, you want to make sure you're present. Yeah, you know, you, when you leave, you leave. And uh, uh, you feel a little bit guilty about that, and, but you go and you go do your job and you come back home and you, you make it right. But it, it, it became a situation now where obviously that with the family, but the travel, I'm not 45 anymore. The, the days are st you know, still 19-hour days. <laughs> Uh, the preparation, the, everything. Uh, I, I'm, I'm going to miss it dearly, but I just knew in my gut it was time. And I was, I was doing the, uh, the TV for the Ironman Wisconsin event. <laughs> yeah. and I'm sitting there going, it's 55 degrees, oh. it's pouring rain. I'm watching you going, this has got to go, okay, you know what? I think it is a good time. <laughs> pouring rain all day long, miserable conditions. And you've had a few of those. Uh, a few of those, and they they take a little more out of you because yeah. uh, everything is exasperated with the weather and the rain and the wet, and it's the same for all the crew working the race, and it just tires you out even more. And it was it was about eight o'clock at night, knowing I had four more hours or so, and I'm going uh, okay, uh, for, I can I can do it for four more hours, and then the two hour mark, I go this is getting hard because yeah. it just wouldn't stop, and right, and uh, maybe it's just because. I've been through such bad weather so many times. I go, I've kind of had it with that. <laughs> I, kind of had I was watching the, the video montage last night, and they're showing, and so many that you're so connected with, watching John Blaze, man. John Blaze rolling across that finish line. And we both knew he had ALS, and he wasn't going to live for a very long time. And he came up to you before the race, and what did he tell you? Well, you know, I said, John, you're going to make it. You can do okay, Mike. If I have to roll across that line, I will. And it's funny. When he came in, Mom and Dad, Bob and Mary Ann were there. Uh, you know, the cameras were there. And I had my arm around him and, and uh, you know, yelled that he was an Iron Man. And then he looked at me, and it just clicked. And he went back, and he rolled across the line. He, See, I told you I was going to roll across the <laughs> line. <laughs> and then that became the ALS honor roll for... Yes. People to honor those with ALS worldwide. Yeah. Worldwide and Ironman <laughs> champion Chrissy Wellington and people yeah. to this day. People Matt Russell. Still they, yeah, people. And Matt Russell, mother, passed away of ALS. So when he first did it as a pro, I said afterwards, oh, you did that in honor of John Blaze. He goes, no, Mike, I, I lost my mother to ALS. And I never knew that. And I'm right. going, oh, my goodness. So he had something to do across that line that John set up when he did it way back when so it was funny I, another thing i saw in the in the montage last night there's a photo from the first united states triathlon series event <laughs> in in uh, del mar california you're doing the announcing 
and you're standing behind Dave Scott with a megaphone. It was before microphones, right? We, we did, they didn't have a sound system set up, so I grabbed the <laughs> megaphone, and, and uh, I said, I'll, I'll do it on this. Hey, had you ever seen that photo before? No. Uh, I, I know. We pulled it out not too long ago, and, and somebody said, is this you, Mike? And I go, oh, my gosh, it is. And there's Dave, and Dave had never seen it, so no. it, it was a classic. I don't even – Lois could have taken it for all we know. The, and just all these iconic moments. The other in 2004, uh, Sarah Reinertson, yeah. single above knee amputee, didn't make the cutoff time, right? Then the following year, it became a whole year, right? She said, Iron Man became the highest maintenance boyfriend I've ever had in my life, right? That was her line. She worked so hard, and you were there to bring her across the line, her unfinished business year. And you can see the joy in both you and in Sarah because you knew what she had gone through and you knew how much it meant to her. You know, when she was coming across the line, I, I went back to the year before and being in that tower, looking back down when she missed the bike cut off, I heard this wailing and crying. I'm going, what's going on? Look at my watch and it's like 5.30 something and Sarah didn't make it and I was, I was in pain. I mean, it was just knowing her and her training in San Diego and then the next year comes and she finishes and that sad sad moment turn, turned into her taking care of unfinished business as she yes. she had her her model uh so when she came through the line i just wanted the crowd to acknowledge it some weren't there the year before some don't know sarah's story exactly. so i have to tell it in a quick reader's digest form because people are finishing and and uh i, I think i did an okay job of getting that crowd going because it was so loud you could hear nothing i love was, that yeah and when did the first person come to you and say hey i want to propose at the finish line oh gosh i think it was in australia and uh ken bags the race director i, I said i said you know somebody came to me and they want to get on their knee and he goes what an athlete i go yeah well who's the person i go i don't know well, I got to get him into the finish line. I go, well, that's your problem. I, I have no idea. <laughs> I go, I'm just telling you what they told me. And I forgot about it during the day. Yeah. And he finished, uh, which I called him in. All of a sudden he stopped and he kind of walked back towards the finish line and nobody was coming in. Turned around and looked and Ken was standing next to his bride to be. His, right. And this kid hit his knee. Uh, she came over and right away in my head, I'm thinking, oh, my gosh, I hope she says yes. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. What if, what if, like, yeah, what I, a I didn't know, I'd never done this before. So, yeah, and she cried, and he had the ring, and he pulled the, cup, pulled the ring out of his pants, and I'm thinking, I hope he got that like a mile ago and didn't carry it. <laughs> anyway, he pulled it out, and she said yes, and everybody was so happy, but he couldn't get up. <laughs> she's like helping him up and i go i wanted to say to her there's your life you're helping this guy <laughs> for the rest of your life you're gonna be helping this guy so that was the first of of many well but you hadn't had a pro do it before until no. patrick lange no when he did it 2018 it was 18 yeah because he won in 17 and then he won again in 18. 18 and he's standing there and julia his girlfriend is there and and we're, you know, I just got done interviewing him, and he's still in awe looking around. He makes eye contact with Julia, and he goes, and I, right away, Did I don't you know, know why, I knew. I go, oh, you got to be kidding me. You got to be kidding me. Walk towards her, hit his knee, and, you know, I put the microphone in his face, and everybody heard him propose to Julia. And it was uh, a very special moment for an Ironman champion to take away from him and propose to the love of his life. It was, it was a special moment. So you were there when at one point, and people don't realize this now, the only Iron Man in the U.S. was this, yes, right? Yes. There was Iron Man Canada, New Zealand, yeah. Australia, but nothing else in the, in the, in the, uh, in the, the U.S. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So when you heard Iron Man Lake Placid was going to be coming, and obviously you're going to do the announcing for the first Iron Man Lake Placid, did you feel like, oh, my God, there's going to be a whole bunch of these? Or did you think... You know what? I'm, we'll try one, see what happens. Well, first off, when I heard about it in like 98, uh, Graham Frazier, who I knew of a little, was putting on races in Canada. Lou Friedland was the CEO. Yep. I didn't assume I would be the announcer. I oh, just, interesting. I just didn't, you know, so I kind of campaigned. I go, hey, I, I'm av I'd be available. That'd be cool. Oh, okay. And I didn't hear anything for like a month, and I'm thinking, 
Okay, I'm just going to Kona. So, <laughs> then they called me, yeah, we, we'd love to have you a part of the, the inaugural Ironman Lake Placid. I never thought in a million years, we'd, I thought Lake Placid was going to be the U.S. race, uh, mainland race, Kona, uh, Australia, New Zealand, Germany, and that was it. Right. But all of a sudden. All of a sudden, then, Lou was so excited about what happened in Placid, he goes, we're going to do Florida, and we're going to do it this year. Yeah, yeah he <laughs> said that about oh, two weeks after the race. Called, by, by the way, we're doing another Ironman this year. And I, like a dummy, I go, in Lake Placid? Yeah, yeah, the second we, one there. We, we yeah. just did. No, we're going to Florida, Panama City Beach. Yeah. You, you want to come? I go, yeah, I think I'd like to come. So. And who would have thought that you go from Panama City, and then you got Coeur d'Alene, oh. and Arizona, and uh, Wisconsin, and who would have thought that all those – it was sort of the advent of online registration. Right. Active, which I think you were there at yeah, the time. Yeah. Active is doing online registration, which makes it a lot easier for people to register. And also it makes it easier for race directors to realize, oh, I've got something hot here. The thing's selling out right away. So you saw it from the inside with Active that these things are selling out as soon as we put them up. And I, I, was, I was a naysayer. I, I thought, well, if you put five Ironmans in mainland USA... What are you going to get? A few, uh, five, six hundred people? Yeah. That wouldn't be financially worth it, I wouldn't think. Yeah. But they just, if the limit was like set at 2,800, boom, they'd hit it. Right away. If it was set at 25, boom, they'd hit it. And I go, what's going on out there? And everybody wanted to do, because of this race, right. they wanted to do an Ironman. And the part of it that I think is so enticing for folks is they had watched this on television and they thought it was for Uber athletes and they'd see Dave Scott and Mark Allen, all the elites. And I think it really became an everyman event. And also those events became welcome mats for people who want to get into our sport. So you were seeing a different athlete at those events than you were seeing here. Oh, no doubt. And with the age groups of the five-year increments, People say, well, I'm 52 years old, 50 to 55. I'm competing against my own age group. I can handle that. Right. I can be a part of that. Yeah. And then when a lot of, all of a sudden, we had our first 70-plus finisher finish, and I think that was uh, Frank Farrar in Wisconsin, you know, all of a sudden, they go, people go, what, a 70-year-old did a Ironman? Are you kidding me? Yeah. I'm, I'm 32. I, what's my excuse? And, and it just bred success, success, and success from race to race. I think that's probably been one of the bigger changes. I was just at the national US, uh, USA Triathlon National Championship in Milwaukee. It was 49 guys in my 70 to 74 age division, <laughs> right? And it's what we call 70 to death. And it, it blew me away that there were so many. And it, as you were, as you've been going to these different Ironman races, the numbers in the older age divisions, yes. changing perceptions of Bill Bell all of a sudden going in 75 to 79 and finishing the race. 80-year-old guys finishing the race, having 90 to 94 and 95 to 99 age divisions in these races. That really came out of what Ironman started. It did, and, and some of the funny things, I mean, I'd see have an older one come on in and all the spectators out there, and I go, here comes you know, Joe Brown, 75 years old. Look at him, or here comes Sally, 72. And then I'd say something like, so is your grandma and grandpa doing that? Yeah. And everybody would look at me like, oh, my God, no. So it, uh, they just realized there's people out there that can do that. And others said, I can do that, too. So 89 is the first one you do and happens to be the greatest race in our history. I mean, talk about the, the stars being aligned. It's the course record. Dave Scott's course record was 828. And that day, he took 18 minutes off his course <laughs> record and lost. Mark goes 809. He goes 810. Dave's course record for the run was 249. That day, he runs 241 and loses, right? So being, that, being your inaugural race, being able to call those guys in, and you're, it's not like people are, you're able to look up on the tracker. Nothing. You got someone at a payphone out by Javi calling in and telling you what's going on. I had, uh, when they took off, I, we knew they were together on the bike. I got a couple of reports out there. And I go, that's cool. They're, they're riding with one another because it's easier to yes. push when you're with someone. And then they get off the bike and they're shoulder to shoulder coming out. Our transition was down to Cahill. No. Uh, uh, Kona Surf. Kona Surf. Yes. And they came out and I got the one mile split from the spotter and they call and I have a pay phone up there, by the way. <laughs> I mean, a, a, a landline. Yeah, it, yeah. it rings. I go, hello. And, and uh, they just went through it. I think he said like 510. And I... I go, no way. So I ignored it. 
I didn't tell anybody. Then they gave me a 5K split, yeah. which was even more ridiculous because now they were running like 508 miles. And one mile, they got close to five minutes. And, yeah. and I said, I, I've got to ignore this because I'm a runner. And I'm thinking, I, I can't tell everybody these guys are running that fast. They'll think I'm an idiot. Then <clears throat> I had a buddy out there at 10K. And he gave me the split. I go, you got to be, sh- Mike, they're running this fast. And I, he knew it. And when I told the crowd, they all started calculating, no way. I go, I'm telling you, it's true. And I remember saying that going, God, I hope this isn't a mistake. I, I'm telling you that it's true. They're running this fast. And then as we got more into it, uh, I, my, my, I said, they're going to break 245. Right. Uh, Calculation-wise. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And when he turned and started, started coming in at 241, I'm going, you got to be kidding me. I had no clue you could do that. I'd, nobody had any clue you could do that. And one of the most special moments at the finish line is when Patrick Lange in 2017 finished third, but he broke Mark's, Mark's course record. record for the run. So when Patrick came in, they gave me the split. Uh, Mark Roy gave me the split from Sports Stats, and I go, oh, my gosh, a new run course record. And I'm looking, and Mark is 20 feet away. And I go, Patrick, you just, you just broke the run course record. Let's go over and with Mark Allen. He goes, no, no, no. Uh, I don't want to go talk to him. I'm, no, I'm no, no. He was so upset he broke his idol's course record. <laughs> but I took him by the hand. Took him up. I go, Mark, he just broke your course record. And Mark gave him a hug and said, that's fantastic. It stood too long. I'm glad somebody did it. And he made Patrick feel like a million dollars. The funny part is I'm sitting with Patrick here yesterday. And we were having an interview with Dave or Mark. And back then, they included the transition time mm. in the run split, run, run right? Split, yeah. So their 240 and 241 were really more like 238, 239. Right. And so we, we talked about that. And so Patrick pulls up his phone, and he goes, you know, I realize that I don't have the course record, and I know I need to run 238.12. <laughs> so he has that on his phone you need to run 238.12 to really have the course record, something like that. So he, Saturday. He, yes. He, oh, Saturday. Okay. He's like, he's got that on his phone now <laughs> Good because for him. he basically said, I don't want to get anything that I don't deserve. They didn't have the run transition in there, so I need to add that. If he runs 238.12 and has a decent bike, yeah. I don't know if he's going to get beat. I uh, think I, he will. I, yeah, it's funny. We talked to dude, David McNamee yesterday. We, he's become our new Nostradamus. We were at St. George and said, David, what do you think is going to happen? And he goes, well, everybody thinks this course, this course is very hard, 7,000 feet of climbing. But we're going to have yeah, probably seven, eight people under eight hours, which nobody thought yeah. anybody was going to do this. And someone's going to win going sub 750. And we're going to have multiple people running in the 230s. And we're like, you're crazy. But it's exactly what happened. Yeah. Right? And so yesterday he said the course record is 751. Someone at a group will be 10 minutes under that, and someone will be running low 230s. I'm like, okay, I'm not doubting that guy ever, but yeah. that's, that's oh, what he that's... told us yesterday, so we'll, we'll, we'll see. The other aspect of this that 89 brought out, it was a race. A lot of, most of the races that we were calling up until then and even after, one person's off the front, and you didn't have They're people. Gone. They yeah. were gone. So now we had a race, and I think that's what Dave was most proud of and Mark, that people were racing to the line that whole time because they were shoulder to shoulder until 23 and a half miles. Yeah, then we had people like uh, Ken Glaw racing in New Zealand against, I think it was Brownie. Was, oh, yeah. yeah. You know, tape, tape wire. I, I want to, I'd love to see another Mark and Dave totally race out there, but I want to see it with three of them. I want to see three of them get off that bike and stick with one another as long as they can. I I, I Everybody deserves that. I, th- I think that could happen the way no question. people are running because they know once they let somebody go, it's over. So they'll kill themselves to try to stay with that lead pack. I, w- I want to see that kind of day. You have been, uh, over the years, since you've been doing this for 33 years, you've called people across the line, and then you've called their kids across the line and probably getting to the point where there's yeah. some grad kids. But also Ironman Arizona a number of years ago, you got to call your son across the line. That had to be one of the most emotional moments for you. It was, you know, almost a half million calls. I still tell people today, it's, obviously it's my most favorite call uh, that I ever made. And it, it was very emotional, but I, I kept it together pretty well. Yep. You know, Rose, mom was there, and 
big sister Aaron was at the finish line, you know, putting the medal and the Mylar blanket around him. And, uh, you know, to have your, your flesh and blood do something that when I started, he was three, you know, he, he, he just, <laughs> and all of a sudden, he, he does an Ironman 30 years later. Yes. I, I just never imagined that. So I'm very proud of him. The story to that, though, the year before he was helping me announce at Arizona, yeah. a bunch of his buddies were in the VIP drinking away, and they yelled up, Andy, we're going to sign up for the race tomorrow. You know, they're drinking. And, and I go, Andy, don't get caught up in that because you know, you'll be stuck. I go, training. None, none of them are in shape. And, and you're, you know, and he goes, yeah, yeah I'm not going to, you know. All of a sudden, the next day, I find out they all went and registered for the race. Did they all do it or just Andy? They all did it. They all did it. Yeah, there was a bunch of them. There was about six of them. They all did the race. That is the yeah, coolest It was thing. cool. The other, the, when we talk about ma major moments, Paul Newby Frazier, 1995, which is such an epic year yeah. because Mark Allen was, he, he had come back after you're away, ran Thomas Hellriegel down, who had a 12 and a half, 13 minute lead. And that was his last race in Kona. Mic drop, I'm done. And he announced beforehand this is going to be his last race. So Paul has sort of got carried away and was like, this is going to be my last race. And she had a big lead. But then she's coming down, and all of a sudden, Karen Smyers catches her. And, again, getting reporting from the course is always tough. Did you know it was Karen, or did you guys assume? Because Paula had a big lead. I didn't know until, the, like, the very last minute when she was hitting a lead. Somebody somehow got the message to us, Paula got passed. And I'm thinking, okay, who the heck was in second? Because you're just... She was so you, far you're, ahead. You're far ahead. And I go, who is in second? Uh, and I knew Karen, and I knew her running gait, her running yep. style. When I pulled out the binoculars, oh, my gosh, that's Karen Smyers, and, and called her in. I, I never... You know what? I brought Karen in with everything I could give her, but it, part of me is going, wait a minute, this almost isn't right. Yeah. You know, congratulations to Karen. What an incredible win. But all day long it was Paula. The last how many years it's been Paula when she got knocked off that day. It was a shock to everybody. And the coolest thing was, and I always like the mindset of a champion, because Paula's racing was always go off the front of the bike yeah. and the race is over. The following year, she stayed with the group on the bike. And she won the race on the run, her last Ironman world title. She got number eight. And that had to be emotional for you as well. It was, and knowing it was her, her last one and – I said, you know, at, the, at eight titles, I said, you know, I don't know if anybody will stick around and do this game yes. this, yeah. as a pro for eight titles. And well, how close are we? Uh, Mark and Dave was six and Tasha was six. If Daniela wins, six, you know, yeah. that's two more still. I know. I, I don't know if anybody's going to touch it. They it. might. Who knows? So, Mr. Mike, thank you so much for always being such a class act. Our 25 years or so of, yeah. of doing the awards and the banquets and endurance sports, uh, endurance sports awards. We spent probably more time on the microphone together <laughs> than we have doing <laughs> anything else. And you were kind enough to wear my stupid cow sport tuxedos. We had these zebra tuxedos zebra, for our, zebra. Big, our zebra tuxedos that Mike was kind enough to wear and humor me a little bit. But it's, it's been a treat. And the cool part is this opens it up for you to do all the stuff you want to do and haven't been able to do. Yeah, I mean, you know, I've always we've always done a lot of stuff, and, and but it it's really more. Next year we'll be calling our own shots. Yes. I had a call from my little sister, and the brothers and sisters always get together every summer, and she sent out an email and said, "Okay, we're looking at the last week of August." For the first time ever, I was the first one to respond. <laughs> we're available. Right. Yeah, and and. Usually I'm the last one to respond till the schedule comes out. Right. And then, then everybody had to change their plans because Mike couldn't be there. So, yes, it's going to be uh, refreshing. <laughs> How about a round of applause for the voice of Iron Man, Mr. Mike Riley. Thank you. Man. Thank you. When I say Mike, you say Riley. Mike Riley. Mike Riley. When I say Mike, you say Riley. Mike, Riley, Mike. Riley. Here we go. When I say breakfast, you say with Bob. Breakfast with, with Bob. Bob. Breakfast with, with Bob. Bob. It's breakfast with Bob. <laughs> and Pancho Man. Yeah. Love it. 